Hello everyone, uh, good afternoon. Uh, it is welcome to our uh, engineering lecture series. Uh, uh, today it's my pleasure and distinct honor to welcome Dr. Kyoki Jackson to Montgomery College. Uh, Dr. Jackson is the Chief Technology Officer at Lockheed Martin, where he is responsible for the corporation's advanced technology strategy, digital transformation, and global information technology operations. He oversees the corporate technology team, which is comprised of 5,000 technologists, engineers, researchers, analysts, and cybersecurity professional, professionals located around the world. Under his direction, the organization is shaping the next era of operational capability and innovation for Lockheed Martin. As the primary liaison to the United States and international science and technology community, he manages strategic relationships with government, industry, and academia to ensure the maturation and deployment of cutting edge technologies. Prior to this role, Dr. Jackson served as the corporate vice president for program excellence where he was responsible for the cross-functional integration of five corporate councils for engineering and technology. Pro technology, production, program management, supply chain, and sustainment. <clears throat> Before joining Lockheed, Dr. Jackson was a NASA researcher, was a NASA, NASA research fellow at Massachusetts Institute of Technology in the field of human adaptation to the space environment. He received his bachelor's, master's, and doctoral degree in aeronautics and astronautics from MIT and completed the Stanford executive program at the Stanford Graduate School of Business. Without further delay, please help me welcome Dr. Jackson. Thank you very much, Dean, and, uh, and a huge thank you to Montgomery College, to the uh, distinguished uh, faculty, administration, staff uh, that invited me here today. And uh, I'd, I'd like to say a couple things uh, in welcome. First of all, happy Halloween, and thank you for being here on this afternoon. Second, uh, are there any Nationals fans here in the audience? Anybody watch the game yesterday? So this is a historic week, 94 years in the making, and uh, I think we should all celebrate that. And then finally, I'd like to just uh, uh, shout out to Serendipity. We have a, a student here who met me in all places, uh, <coughs> London, uh, a couple of months ago. And one thing led to another, and having the opportunity to talk to uh, some faculty. And then uh, here I am with the opportunity to speak to the, uh, the School of Engineering, uh, Computer Science. And I'm thrilled to be here, and not least because I am a proud uh, resident of uh, Montgomery County and of Rockville. I live about half a mile down the road here, just on the other side of Route 28. And so I am very excited to, to be here today. Uh, let me just get a little bit of a sense here of the room. So how many students uh, are, are pursuing uh, engineering in the room here? So a pretty heavy majority. Any computer scientists, mathematicians? Uh, architects, or just, uh, there's a whole, whole series, uh, but anyway, thank you for the opportunity to give a little bit of an overview. Uh, so the question that was posed to me is, what can you say about the state of innovation, uh, both in the United States and globally, and maybe what are some of the implications for the future of work and the future of our, you know, people in STEM fields? Uh, as we look out in, into the years ahead. And so I will try to answer that question, and that's a big question, and I'm gonna try to touch on some of my experience at Lockheed Martin and, uh, and give you some of my observations about how the world has changed over the past couple of decades and some of the things that maybe uh, uh, we have been doing about it in our business, uh, but more importantly, what that means for all of us who are excited to be engineers or computer scientists or scientists or mathematicians and to really drive innovation uh, in our own lives but also across uh, the nation and the world. 
And uh, again, you know, it's exciting for me to see students uh, in places like London. It's clear that Montgomery College is having a global impact here. So if you look at the United States, you could say, wow, we really are a powerhouse. And uh, that is true. And it's extremely exciting. And so let me just give a couple of examples here. Uh, first of all, we have an incredibly uh, robust and productive system for innovation here in the United States. We invest annually about half a trillion dollars in research and development. We have a quarter of the entire world's patent filings coming out of the United States. We have a national laboratory system that is probably, I, I, I shouldn't say probably, it is without a doubt the envy of any other nation in the world. Just an incredible system. It includes things like the Department of Energy Labs, the science laboratories, but also NIST right here up the road, which is you know, the, the National Institute of Standards and Technology and a world leader in producing Nobel laureates, for example. We have, again, the envy of the world in terms of our overall infrastructure uh, for doing research and development, although there are some big concerns on that front in terms of our direction ahead. We produce more startups than any place in the world. We have the most venture capital funding of anywhere in the world. And one of the beauties, I mean, we have a system that is driven, you know, it's based on the principles of you know, what the United States was founded on, principles of free enterprise, of self-determination, the ability to really go out and do the things that individuals want to do, to start companies, to create value, to pursue the things that interest them. And so that translates to a couple of things. One is people take risks in this country that they wouldn't take in other parts of the world. Two, it really reduces the barriers for entrepreneurship. And so if you look at the number of companies that started each year, um, there's a couple of interesting things. One is, you know, a lot of those don't succeed, but a lot of them do. The second thing is people who start companies often start additional companies. And this is you know, something that's really exciting for me to see as I think about my kids, and so my son is a, is a junior in high school now, and when I was, when I was in school, there, were a lot, there was a lot lower or a lot less emphasis on entrepreneurship and the ability as, a, as an engineer or a scientist to uh, kind of go out there and start your own firm, and especially when you look at the, the, how these barriers have dropped in the software world, this really is something that's almost in the, in the opportunity space of just about anybody. Uh, and then, of course, our universities. And the United States has you know, a majority of the top universities in the top 20. Uh, we have an incredible uh, diversity of opportunities. And I, I really want to speak out about the, uh, you know, the importance of the community college system in the United States. Clearly, um, the best and most affordable uh, way to get into STEM fields uh, in the United States. I, had, I was closely associated. I used to live up in Pennsylvania a few years ago and, and was on the uh, advisory board of the Bucks County Community College there. And it was incredible to me the, the breadth of talent that was coming um, to places like Lockheed Martin, we were a huge uh, uh, employer, um, but the vast array of opportunities that were opened up. And so that, again, is one of the strengths of the United States is this, uh, this array of diverse opportunities in higher education. So that's the good news, right? I mean, if you looked at this, you'd say, we've got it made. So is that the whole story? So maybe 50 years ago, you could kind of leave it at that. But the world has changed over the past years, and it's changing even faster now. And so I want to point out a few things. Uh, if you look back about 60 years ago, so 1960, where was the investment going, or coming from? So you saw that $500 billion a year number in the United States. At that time, we the United States did about 70% of the advanced research and development for the entire world. 
which is kind of amazing to think about. And that's really what made the U.S. That, this, the powerhouse that it is today. But today that has basically flip-flopped. And so now uh, less than 30% of the global uh, research and development is done within the United States. And interestingly, that's not because we're doing less research here in the U.S., but because there's been this tremendous upgrowth or upswing of other nations basically looking at what was accomplished here in the U.S. and saying, wow, we could do that too. And so especially as you look at some uh, of the Asian countries, Korea, Japan, but now more and more China, and China is on track in this year or next to essentially uh, outspend the United States in basic research. So we can no longer count on essentially just spending our way out or you know, achieving that top position by what we spend. A couple of other things. Uh, I talked about that, um, that um, the importance of the entrepreneurial world and venture capital and how the U.S. is you know, the single largest or country in terms of that spending. Uh, but if you look at what's happened, well, first of all, a lot of other people have clued in that creating uh, companies and funding technology ventures is a good way to drive economic growth, productivity, jobs, and all the other things that we want uh, in our countries. And so that number in the last uh, you know, 25 years or so has gone from two billion, so this is, you know, any of you engineers are gonna look at that and say, hey, those are not to scale and you're right. So two billion, the, the dot was so small that you couldn't see the uh, wedges compared to 154 billion today. And uh, that's kind of an amazing trend, right? Um, but the other thing that's interesting is going from roughly 97% funded by the United States to less than half funded by the United States. So obviously we're still kind of the single dominant player in that space, but there's a lot of other nations that are catching up there. And then I mentioned this crown jewel of the U.S., our national laboratory system, and that includes things, you know, of course, our, our Department of Energy labs, the science labs, NIST, and so on, but broadly speaking, uh, other facilities, NASA, uh, the armed forces all have R&D labs. But the reality is that we have, as a nation, really underinvested in keeping those facilities modern and investing in the new. And so in many cases, we're closing down capability faster than we're creating new capability. And for one, uh, this is uh, just one uh, of the major technology laboratories here, and this is public uh, information. But look at these numbers. So 50%, more than 50%, more than half of the buildings, the facilities on the main campus in poor condition. Over 40% of the space in that major campus is outdated or obsolete. And so when we think about investing in infrastructure, and we, it's, it's easy for us when you drive down the road and there are potholes uh, or the GW Parkway is half closed, or you go over a bridge and uh, say, gee, I hope they fix this in the next uh, couple of years. We should also be thinking about the infrastructure that creates opportunity, economic opportunity, growth through research and development because that infrastructure is so incredibly important to our nation and to the technologies. I'll give you an example. Uh, anybody here interested in quantum information sciences, quantum computing, I'm sure we, with the number of engineers and computer scientists we've got. So we have at our top laboratory system uh, Nobel laureate quality researchers and yet their facilities, uh, to give you an example, and you know, quantum, I mean, th so we're doing stuff typically in quantum research that's at you know, fractions of a degree above absolute zero, very controlled environmental conditions. And they're controlling the temperature in their lab by opening and closing the window because you don't have adequate HVAC systems, right? So this is the kind of thing where you look at this and say, okay, we have opportunity to improve. So, is this a bad news story? It's a mix, right? Because we have, we have the envy of the world, but at the same time we can see that if we don't continue to invest, uh, we have a real chance that we'll be overtaken or surpassed by others. And especially when you look at investments in places like China, where there is a very uh, focused effort 
uh, and a written plan that says we're going to become dominant in various areas like artificial intelligence, quantum information sciences, uh, radio frequency engineering, go down the list. So that's, that's our situation. So what can we do about that? And I want to segue here to a little bit of what Lockheed, how Lockheed Martin thinks about this world. And I figured I should probably introduce Lockheed Martin uh, for those of you who may not know Lockheed Martin well. So we are a Maryland company. Uh, we're just down the road here. Our headquarters is in Bethesda. But we really are a global uh, corporation. Um, we have over 70 uh, our facilities in over 70 nations around the world. Uh, we have well over 100 facilities here in the United States in almost every state in the U.S. And uh, I'll just give you a little bit of my history. I started at Lockheed Martin in Sunnyvale, California, so in Silicon Valley. I spent about a dozen years there. Moved to a satellite manufacturing facility in Pennsylvania, uh, just northeast of Philadelphia. I was there for about five years, and now I've been here in the D.C. area, uh, although I spend about two-thirds of my time on airplanes and going to our various sites uh, in the U.S. and around the world. And we're, we do a lot of different things, uh, but if you look at a common theme here, we are a technology company. And so if, I mean, we write more lines of code in a year than Microsoft Corporation. Uh, we have uh, a whole series of efforts in advanced aeronautics. Uh, people probably have heard of the F-35, the Joint Tactical Fighter, Joint Strike Fighter, so world's most advanced uh, fighter aircraft. Uh, we build the most advanced spacecraft in the world, and that's the part of the business that I came out of. Um, anybody, anybody here use GPS today? I think probably everybody, did you use your cell phone today? Because the timing signals are driven by our GPS constellation. <coughs> If you used Google Maps or Uber or any of these kinds of things, again, driven by uh, GPS. Uh, our power grid, the timing uh, controls, driven by GPS uh, timing signals. And so these are the kinds of things where um, we, we, just, we, we do some of the most advanced communications and defense and commercial satellites uh, anywhere in the world. Uh, missiles and fire control. We build the most sophisticated uh, anti-ballistic missile defense systems uh, in the world. Uh, programs like the Patriot Advanced Capability or the, the THAAD program, the Theater High Altitude Area Defense uh, Program. Um, so when you hear about uh, defenses against uh, uh, missile threats, these are the kinds of systems that are, provide those defenses uh, both here and for our allies around the world. And the rotary and mission systems, uh, so this includes things like advanced helicopters, uh, the safest uh, and most advanced executive helicopter in the world, uh, the Black Hawk helicopter, which is the most widely produced uh, helicopter in, in U.S. history um, for our armed forces and our most advanced heavy lift uh, helicopters, among other things. And we're, I'll just throw this fact out there. So we're building a helicopter today. We call it X2 technology. It goes about twice as fast as a normal helicopter by having counter-rotating uh, uh, rotor blades plus a uh, pusher prop on the back. So really amazing feat uh, of aeronautics there. Any aer budding aeronautical engineers in the room out of curiosity? We've got a handful. I'm, gl I'm glad to see that. Uh, so that's a little bit of a snapshot. Um, on the technology front, and this is the biz part of the business that I'm in today. I've been TTO for about five years now. And just want to give you a sense, we spend about $1.3 billion as a corporation um, on internal research and development. So these are on the order of 600 different research programs every year. Uh, we engage um, several thousand, so it, we have 54,000 scientists and engineers across the corporation. Uh, but uh, over 4,500 um, in areas like information technology and another handful of thousand engaged in advanced R&D. We have over 30 research sites around the country. Uh, we have a number of what I call major advanced sites. Anybody here of the Skunk Works, the SR-71, the U-2, some of these planes? Uh, uh, typically, we don't hear about what they do until years after it happens, but uh, that's just one example and a very active patent portfolio. And by the way, we're also, you say, well, you know, 
we talk about entrepreneurship. So we actually have our own venture fund. We have a $200 million fund. Uh, we invest in on the order of you know five to seven companies a year. And a lot of that these days is in areas like our artificial intelligence, um, advanced uh, antennas for uh, mobility applications, advanced sensors, quantum information sciences. So really exciting to be t able to take advantage of that whole uh, piece of the ecosystem. And I just want to give you a little bit of a view. Um, given that breadth of the portfolio, well, you know, how, do, how do we go about that? So I mentioned that we have uh, about 36 R&D sites, but the bulk of that research and development is focused in these advanced development areas like the Skunk Works. I'll give you an example, another example, our Advanced Technology Center in Palo Alto. So they're in the heart of Silicon Valley. It's sort of over the fence from uh, Stanford and NASA Ames, um, and that is where we do some of our most sophisticated space payload and sensor design. We've built a whole series of solar study and solar observation missions. We've built the primary camera, what's called NIRCAM, the Near Infrared Camera, that's going on the James Webb Space Telescope, which is uh, up at Goddard right now and, uh, and getting ready to launch, hopefully, in the not too distant future. And we'll look back more than 12 billion years into kind of the, the dawn of our universe um, uh, through by looking in this IR spectrum where we haven't had the chance to do that observation from space. So across the board, Sikorsky Innovations, I talked about that X2 technology. They're driving forward and putting into rotorcraft not just speed, but artificial intelligence and autonomy. Think about a helicopter that can fly by itself out to an oil rig, put down you know, with perfect precision in zero, zero, what we call weather conditions, so can't see and can't see down, right? No ceiling. Um, and that's hugely important for the kinds of, you know, if, if you think about it, if you can't make that landing, you've got a plane full or a cargo of, uh, of folks who are going to go work on that oil rig, you've got to take them all back, you've got to pay for all that overtime for the people who are still out on the oil rig, the folks that you just brought back, then you've got to go and do it all over again when the weather gets better. So uh, really important in terms of economic value. And then over here on the right, I wanted to mention uh, the importance of international collaboration. And uh, this is something that is really prevalent today. I mean, I talked about you know, all of these trends in terms of R&D increasing around the globe, venture capital increasing around the globe. So for the U.S., that means that we, we're not going to rely on doing it all ourselves here. We have to be out there looking for the best ideas wherever they are. And so about three years ago, we opened, you know, and we're largely in the defense space. So we're pretty focused on the United States, but we said we have to be out there in the Asia Pacific region. We have to be out there internationally. We opened a laboratory that's uh, growing uh, very well down in uh, Australia. And it's given us that entree into a whole broader ecosystem of international research. And we're using this as a model for uh, changing the way we think about how we get technology. So it's not just about going out uh, you know, to, um, say, startup companies or doing it all internally, but also looking around the world. So I mentioned some of the things that we're working on, but I wanted to give you an idea of how we think about technology. And uh, so, First of all, you have to, I mean, we're a business, and so ultimately, if we develop technology that nobody ever wants to buy, uh, we're effectively destroying value, right? We're throwing away investment dollars that could be spent on something else. And so we really started, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about how we do this, but started with where we think our customers have their biggest needs. And we looked at in the sort of the 10 to 20 year time frame and we peeled that back and we came up with a set of what we call strategic investments. And so, um, and I'll talk about a little bit of a, a theme here, but um, these are areas like autonomy, robotics, cybersecurity, uh, signal processing and computation, sensors and sensor exploitation, um, directed energy. Uh, and then, and we, what we saw is that these are actually impacting not one or two parts of our business, but we're seeing that impact across that very broad range of what Lockheed Martin does. Next thing, I think this is probably something that you're observing here, uh, this whole set of enabling technologies. So if you look off on the right, 
advanced electronics, sort of that uh, Moore's Law and beyond Moore's Law driven uh, increase in electronics capability, processing, processing power, uh, you know, the, the miniaturization and the mobility uh, that we're seeing in almost everything that we do in electronics, and the incredible decrease in the cost of these as we move to this mobile world. So, um, so that's really important. Advanced materials and manufacturing. This is things like nanomaterials, 2D and uh, 1D materials, uh, you know, so carbon nanotubes and graphenes and things like that. Um, also data analytics. Anybody here studying uh, techniques for big data, data analytics? So I, I'd just say, you know, this is something I would encourage everybody to pay attention to because these tools are essentially becoming democratized and it's something that is essentially going to be in the pocket or in the hands of every uh, scientist, engineer, and mathematician. Um, so these are technologies where for every dollar that, say, the United States uh, defense and aerospace industry invests, they're so driven by the commercial world. You know, there's hundred dollars to a thousand dollars being invested in research and development uh, commercially. So when we look at those as enabling technologies, we say, well, we will invest in those things that allow us to distinguish what we do in, you know, aerospace or uh, satellites or radar development. But we're not going to do that base investment because it's effectively already paid for, you know, a thousand times over uh, elsewhere in the world. And then I did want to note a little bit on operational technology. And so that leverages, so the way we think about technology, there are the things that we invest in that go into our spacecraft, our helicopters, our aircraft, our radars, our missile systems, and rockets, and so on. Um, and we call those our product technologies. But then we have uh, over 100,000 folks within Lockheed Martin. Uh, we have enormous investments in manufacturing facilities around the U.S. and around the world. And so those technologies that are driving operations, augmented and virtual reality, cognitive assistance, uh, advanced human-machine interfaces, so think things like exoskeletons so that people can uh, do much more in the factory environment without injuring themselves. All of these things if you think back, they rely on many of the same technologies, so AI, robotics, um, and so on. So we're looking at that whole ecosystem saying, okay, if we're investing it to make a better aircraft, well, we can probably use the same sorts of technologies internally and get double the bang for the buck. And I did want to give you a little bit of an idea of how we think about why we invest in certain things. And, uh, so any, I'm, I'm sure anybody here do agile software development or heard the term agile? In, uh, yeah. So the same principles apply in the development of technology. And one of the core principles is making sure that everything you do is driven ultimately in response to the needs of the customer. And our customers have, you know, by and large, um, in national defense and national security, in areas like aircraft uh, where, or human space flight, where safety of life is absolutely critical. It's the kind of at the forefront of everything we do. And so working closely with our customers to understand their biggest needs is the starting point. And so within our technology organization, interestingly, the first thing we do isn't go out and do research. The first thing we do is actually sit down with our customers. We do tabletop exercises to understand what actually makes a difference for them in their missions. Uh, we try to understand, um, you know, if I was to invest in, you know, if I was to buy a pound of AI versus a pound of, uh, say, cybersecurity, which one actually makes a, a difference? That's probably not the right unit, I know. But uh, anyway, um, so. This for me is particularly exciting because it allows us to really get with our customers in their most demanding missions. And it's particularly exciting. I, I, I talked about GPS and you know, it, it was very gratifying for me to have the opportunity to run those programs in the U.S. Um, and know that four or five billion people every day were being touched by that. But it really came home to me, a uh, young major, um, in uh, the Air Force, uh, and he was relaying a story about coming back on a mission uh, in Afghanistan with a uh, 
with a uh, whole helicopter full of folks and you know this uh, this master sergeant's kind of there exhausted with his head down and uh, the major says hey by the way what do you think about GPS and he lifts his head up and perks up and he says GPS GPS brings my people home every day it's bringing us home to our families today and that was you know for me uh, something that indicates how important it is to understand our customers needs and then how gratifying it can be when you actually satisfy these really really critical mission needs so you know R&D can seem a little dry sometimes uh, but when you look at the impacts and I just talked about the impact of you know broadcasting atomic clock timing signals from space from you know 30 plus satellites and measuring that to, you know a few picoseconds of accuracy but how can we not get excited about some of the things that are happening out there today and uh, so some of the things that we're investing in and you might look at these and say well what does this have to do in some of these cases with you know your primary industry aerospace and defense uh, but uh, the first thing I'll say is we have to stretch our people. We have to give them things that are really above the top hard and allow them to prove themselves. And a lot of times, you know, just setting that expectation of, you know, we are going to tackle the toughest challenges is really important for the entire organization. And so you see things like compact fusion. And uh, this is an incredibly difficult problem. Uh, you know, there's jokes like uh, you know, fusion energy is uh, 30 years away and always has been. Um, but we're excited about this because if, if we can get this to work, it will be an absolute game changer uh, for the world, right, in terms of clean, reliable, sustainable energy uh, forever, effectively. Let me point out a couple of things. We're actually working right now for NASA on what's called the X-59, the uh, quiet supersonic transport. So this is a demonstrator. We haven't really had supersonic transport uh, in many years, and we've never had it over land. And the reason is because the sonic booms from uh, the Concorde were uh, effectively so loud and so disturbing that they were banned from flying, flying over land or over populated areas. That really limited the utility and ultimately the market for that aircraft. But we now have far, far better design tools, better analysis tools, better computational fluid dynamics, uh, better generative design tools to rapidly explore a whole different array of uh, aerodynamic configurations. So now if we can build something that sounds more like, you know, a thump, you know, or dropping a book on a table versus out there somebody, you know, trying to break your windows with a hammer, you know, that's a big deal. And so we could, you know, when we prove this out, actually open the door for the first time in a generation to having supersonic transport for, you know, your average uh, customer, right? So that's something that's incredibly exciting. Talk about quantum. And anybody read the uh, article in the last couple of weeks about Google and uh, the, really the first demonstration of quantum supremacy? So quantum information sciences, uh, you know, we, we've been riding this wave for the last, uh, you know, about six decades of Moore's Law and packing more and more transistors into smaller and smaller area while driving the cost of that whole thing down at the same time. But ultimately, you get to the point where you run out of atomic spacing, right? And uh, so we're pretty close to that point. And there are other techniques that people are using, 2.5D, 3D techniques, to keep going down the Moore's Law track. But what if you could do computation in a completely different way, in a way that effectively, you know, by utilizing some of these fundamental quantum properties of matter, superposition, entanglement, uh, be able to solve problems that are effectively intractable today with any kind of a classical computer. I mean, it take, you know, longer than the lifetime of the universe to actually compute. So that's why last week's announcement, and you, people might say, well, it was kind of a toy problem or, you know, it was, was you, it not practically useful. But it's the first case um, where there, we believe there's been this demonstration. And so that probably will be a watershed moment in terms of, you know, when we look back in time, uh, having effective and practical quantum computers that could solve these problems uh, that could never be addressed before. Simulating fundamental properties of matter, simulating brand new materials that have never been imagined before. Um, 
And so that, for me, is very exciting. So I just want to give you an idea of some of the kinds of things that we invest in. Uh, a, because we think they're going to transform our world, and B, because we want to make sure that we are working on the very hardest challenges. And that, I think, oops, I'm, hopefully haven't destroyed this. That, I think, is where the U.S. needs to keep our heads. And uh, let me give you one more example before I wrap up here. So 1972 is the last time that there was a human on the moon um, or in, uh, in that orbit. So we have uh, had incredible advances, and I had the luxury and the joy of being a part of the shuttle program in the heyday of that uh, part of NASA's history. Uh, but it's time to look outward again. And so I talk about those big challenges. We talk about moonshots. So if anybody is in, I know we've got a handful of folks that are interested in aerospace, but I'll say this. You know, this is going to be an adventure that involves you know, mechanical engineers, electrical engineers, computer scientists, software engineers, uh, explorers of all kinds. And the exciting thing to me is that NASA has put a mar marker out there. I saw the NASA administrator three times last week uh, give a version of this speech. But we're going back to the moon, and we're going to go back to the moon, put the first woman and the next man on the south pole of the moon uh, by 2024 which is an extremely exciting and extremely ambitious goal. And uh, I'm really pleased as a, you know, at Lockheed Martin to be a part of that. And uh, so we design what's called the Orion. This is the first spacecraft that's really been ever designed in the world for long-term deep space exploration. The first spacecraft that is designed to go outside of low Earth orbit in many, many uh, years. And we had the first launch uh, back in December of 2014. So now the next stage is what we call the Artemis program. And uh, Artemis uh, in uh, Greek mythology is the twin sister of Apollo, the goddess of the moon. So a very aptly named uh, uh, program here. And uh, we're coming up in late 2020, so late next year or early 2021. The plan is to send that first Artemis mission, an uncrewed mission, out around the moon. That will be the first time that we've actually had a, a human-capable spacecraft uh, in orbit around the moon uh, since that 1972 time frame. Soon thereafter, about 2024, the plan is uh, to be able to get those first uh, crewed missions out there and then by, by the end of 2024 to actually get people on the surface of the moon again and again. Uh, What's so exciting about that is we're going not just to go and come back, but to posture to stay on the moon and have a permanent presence. And so the plan is to put in place not just a, a, a mission there and back, but an infrastructure, what we call the Lunar Gateway, um, that will allow multiple reusable trips back to and from the gateway to the surface of the moon. And in fact, uh, I had the opportunity uh, to see Jeff Bezos last week announce a partnership uh, that includes Lockheed Martin, Northrop Grumman, uh, and the Draper Laboratories uh, that are going to put together, uh, it really is a national team, to be able to put in place that whole uh, gateway infrastructure. So, uh, and that, that descent and ascent phase coming back, or to the surface of the moon and back again. So, uh, so moonshots are really happening. And, uh, and so as the United States, we need to keep these kinds of opportunities out there. Uh, we need to make the investments um, that are going to pull our nation along because for every, you know, everything that we invest in a program like that results in a whole suite of technologies that would not have been developed otherwise uh, to solve these incredibly hard problems. And the other thing I wanted to note is it's not, you know, I talked about these, this big infrastructure, and I talked about national labs, I talked about NASA. But the reality is innovation comes from people, it comes from individuals. And it's so important to provide opportunities for people to be able to you know, try their hand at solving these tough challenges. So I wanted to give you a couple of examples. Anybody heard of Alpha Pilot? This is, uh, so we're having our 
second race here. It's actually this weekend, Saturday at the convention center. And uh, so I think there's tickets available, but um, I'll have to look into that a little bit further. But uh, this is the, with the Drone Racing League. So these are the folks that fly, race drones at you know, 90 miles an hour um, using VR headsets and so on. Uh, this is the first artificially intelligent uh, drone racing league. So they call it AIRR, the AI, uh, the Robotic Racing League. And so this is a partnership with uh, DRL. Uh, we're working with NVIDIA, who pr produces the greatest uh, chips out there for artificial intelligence processing. And we're going to find out if AIs can actually do better than the best uh, drone racers. And I'll say we've got nine universities. There was a, a worldwide competition. F over 400 teams from around the world competed to get into the league, if you will. And uh, this is a hard problem. So uh, the first race. Two teams made it, uh, I think three teams made it through one gate. One team made it through two gates. But what we saw is just over the course of those races, massive improvement. We're expecting to see even more. And this is one of these Moore's Law kinds of things where you're on an exponential growth path. And once some of these basic problems are solved, we're going to see, I pro project, that the AIs will defeat the uh, humans. Hard to uh, say exactly when that will happen, but uh, just like with AlphaGo, uh, and the computer, or Deep Blue and Chess, AlphaGo and Go, uh, we'll see the same at some point uh, here. So we're trying to use the, the power of this worldwide talent base through these innovation challenges. There's a $2 million prize, uh, or $2 million worth of prizes here, uh, including a bonus uh, if they actually beat the best human racers. Um, so we're trying to make sure that uh, we are driving that, uh, that development of talent and those uh, new techniques in artificial intelligence. Lastly, what does this mean for folks like ourselves, folks like you who are going to be out there in the world, and what should you be thinking about? So I spent a lot of time talking about revolutionary technologies. I mean, the world of design, the tool sets that we have are so far advanced uh, compared to where they were when I was in school. So uh, that's pretty exciting. I mean, you have you know, power, powerful engineering tools and techniques that weren't available to generations before. Um, not to mention, you know, things like additive manufacturing, uh, where essentially you can go in the digital thread from concept requirements, design, production, and test without uh, ever leaving that, uh, that sort of digital world. New capabilities. I talked about exoskeletons, but augmented reality and visual reality, being able to immerse ourselves in environments that are a combination of the physical world that we're in, but with that wealth of data uh, in there with us. And what does all of that mean? It means that we have immense demand for technical talent. And you know the numbers are staggering. In terms of over the next decade, we anticipate that there's going to be over a million jobs, technical jobs in the United States that are going to go unfilled just because we don't have enough uh, science, technology, engineering, and math uh, graduates coming out. And uh, just within Lockheed Martin, so over the next five to seven years, we're going to be hiring 50,000 50, uh, STEM graduates. And this is because of our business growth, it's also because of the retirements that are happening now. And moreover, it's because we have a whole new set of skills that you are learning in school today that we need very much uh, within Lockheed Martin. And the last thing that's out there is, you know, these are technologies that are changing quickly. And so I think you are a generation that is uh, seeing essentially education happen in a different way than it has in the past. You know, it's much more online, it's much more tailored to the individual student, and it is much more a lifelong activity. And so, you know, I'm, we have what we call Digital Academy at Lockheed Martin, and our engineers are in there, uh, you know, learning and developing and picking up new skills in cybersecurity, in software development, in, uh, in agile programming, in data analytics, in additive manufacturing, you go down the list. And this is the reality of the world uh, that we're in. So I just have to say, you know, there has not been a more exciting time in what I would say the last generation. I talked about space. Hasn't been a more exciting time in the space world uh, you know, probably since the Apollo era, certainly since the uh, dawn of the shuttle era here. 
But I'll say this, anybody who is interested in engineering, who is excited about innovation, who, is, who wants to push the boundaries of technology, this is the best time to be in a technical field. And frankly, I talked about the United States. Um, we have our challenges. But the reality is there is no better place to be in the world than the United States today. If you're exciting, uh, or excited about pushing the boundaries, uh, our, our free enterprise system, our capitalist system, the, the breadth of opportunities, the focus on entrepreneurship, and the investment uh, that's being made in everything from AI and quantum to uh, the education of our students are going to continue to keep uh, the U.S. powering forward. So let me stop there and uh, see if I can answer any questions uh, from the audience. And I'll just, uh, I'll try to repeat the questions, but uh, there is a microphone here, so we'll pass the microphone around to anybody who's got a question. Go ahead and I'll repeat the question. So the question was uh, around space debris, and are we looking at any programs to uh, alleviate that problem? Maybe I'll just uh, I give you a couple of examples. Um, so, you know, a generation ago, there really wasn't that much stuff in space. Now we're launching, literally, uh, in some cases, hundreds or thousands of tiny satellites. Um, and it turns out that uh, they actually do collide. And sometimes that's intentional. The Chinese shot down one of their weather satellites uh, a few years ago and created an enormous crowd of, or cloud of debris, some of which is going to last you know, tens of thousands of years. But there was also an Iridium satellite uh, that ran into a uh, defunct Soviet uh, satellite and a similar problem there. Um, so you think about sustainability, right? And we always think about you know, things like carbon footprint and so on. We also have to think about the sustainability of that space environment. So there's a lot of really intriguing ideas out there. Um, we have looked at everything from, uh, you know, are there ways that you could collect debris? Uh, we've done uh, surveys of how you might do satellite servicing or satellite removal. We've also looked at things like, could you use a higher energy laser to effectively deorbit uh, certain kinds of debris? So uh, you know, the big question is the economics of that. The other thing that, of course, uh, in the United States is signatory to a, a set of uh, international agreements where basically you have to deorbit uh, whatever you put up there within 25 years or have the ability to push it up into a higher orbit that's out of the way. And so, of course, a lot of work uh, on the Lockheed Martin side to prevent the problem from occurring by doing the right kind of disposal, either back to Earth or out of the way. Thank you for the question. Please. Um, as the CTO, I'm guessing, um, for you probably know things at a very high clearance level of supporting the government. Mm -hmm. um, concerning CFRs and Scott Works CFR, um, is there any design, potential design, that would become a real thing if that CFR came full through? Some really exciting thing that you'd be able to share. Yeah, I, so first of all, I gotta couch this, right? This is not like a design that we're gonna be you know, <coughs> shipping next year, right? Yeah. Uh, this is really advanced research and advanced technology. It's, it's, there's some, it's in more of the basic science realm, just understanding how to contain plasmas and things like that. So, but, it, but it, the promise here, um, the difference, and I won't get into the details, but uh, the difference is that this is a design, if it works out, could be far more, and we talk about compact, right? So far smaller. If you look at some of these other tokamak designs or, or other containment strategies, I mean, these are enormous things, right? They are, they, they, they you know, uh, half a mile across in some case, I mean, very big. And so this is something that conceivably could fit, you know, on the back of a, a large truck, for example. And so the beauty of something like that is now it gives you not only the promise of unlimited power, but also the promise of portable power that can be produced uh, pretty much anywhere. Taken. So you could think about applications, for example, in space flight. And uh, one of those key things about space is, you know, with unlimited power, pretty much anything is possible. And so that would be a wonderful uh, enabling capability there. Please. We got a mic here. So I 
want to start off by saying that my dad actually used to work for Lockheed Martin um, a while ago. Now he's at Booz Allen Hamilton. Yeah. Um, but I intend to join an ROTC program, mm -hmm. and I'm actually uh, going to study data analytics mm -hmm. um, in this field. But I was curious, um, you had mentioned a lot, and you were speaking about how China is um, almost going to eclipse the United States in innovation. And I remember hearing a while ago that the CEO of Northrop Grumman was very concerned about how China um, tends to copy a lot of your designs and through your supply chain, relying a lot on mm -hmm. some of the rare earth elements in China. How are you, how does Lockheed Martin shield their intellectual property and designs from um, our enemies such as China? Uh, uh, so really good question. Uh, so the question was, if, if we're worried about the level of investment uh, in places like China, um, how do we essentially not give away the store here uh, for those advanced technologies? So how do we think about protecting the IP that we develop uh, here, um, both at Lockheed Martin and more broadly? And, uh, and it is a critical question. And this is, of course, one of the things that's driving a lot of the trade, and not just now, but over the past many years, has driven trade tensions with China, is that theft of intellectual property um, and lack of, re I'd say, respect for uh, both uh, rule and convention and law uh, in that area, and uh, also forced technology transfer. So if you want to do business in China, typically you have to basically sign over or give up the technology uh, uh, for the products that you're producing. So that's playing out, of course, right now in uh, the various uh, the trade difficulties today. But you point out that uh, China has had a concerted effort to essentially get, and, and by the way, it's not just China, so I shouldn't uh, just, I, I do need to make that point. There are a lot of folks out there that want to get their hands on U.S. developed technology. And so there's a couple of things, um, you know, first of all, you know, not making it easy, right? And so uh, I talked about cybersecurity being one of the critical areas for research and development. But also just down the road here uh, in Rockville, we have our Security and Intelligence Center, uh, what we call the SIC. Um, but that's where we, one of the places around the world where we monitor and control our own uh, networks and capabilities. And, uh, and that's really important to uh, look at intrusions or counter intrusions before they happen, understand the various threats that are happening 24-7, uh, train and educate our people um, about how to be smart in terms of cyber hygiene. So that, that protection and defense, and this is really active defense, we developed a whole uh, strategy that's well known now called the cyber kill chain, which is really a series of processes and ways to think about cybersecurity to prevent people from getting at that critical data. So that's one piece. But the other thing, you know, is uh, really having, again, a business-driven um, and mission-driven uh, strategy around protecting the important things. And uh, we live in a free uh, society here. And in fact, you know, many of you probably, if you go on to graduate school, you're going to do research. And you're, going, you know, you're probably going to do research as undergraduates. Um, and many of you will publish that. And that's one of the most powerful things about uh, our system and about the society that we live in is that we take these incredibly important findings and we put them out there for the betterment of not just the U.S. but for the entire world, for all of humanity. And so that's, that's critical. But at the same time, if you're going to take that basic research and turn it into an application, you have to make sure that you know what's important and how you're going to protect it and then uh, make sure that your entire organization uh, knows what needs to be done to do to put in place those protections. Susan, are we in danger of losing some of our researchers because of the deterioration of our uh, infrastructures in the United States? Are they going to other countries? Uh, I, I, th that's a complicated question. Um, what I've seen is, in spite of some of that deterioration, we still have the best community of scientists and engineers in the world, um, and the best broader ecosystem. And it's really the great people that attracts other great people uh, above and beyond things like the R&D capabilities. 
but the reality is that other nations are starting to have their own significant uh, and, and uh, great communities of researchers. And when they invest also in significant uh, capabilities, R&D capabilities, new facilities and so on, that starts to tip the balance. So it's certainly something that we're concerned about uh, here in the U.S. I'd also, and by the way, um, Sue, could you stand up here? So this, this is important. She's actually the most important person here. Uh, um, she is in our university talent acquisition uh, organization. And so if you think you might at some point be interested in Lockheed Martin, I encourage you to stop by and see Sue before you take off. And, uh, and again, I, I know that we're out of time here. So I just want to thank, again, Montgomery College. I want to thank uh, the administration, staff, faculty, and most of all the students here. You are in an incredibly exciting time. I hope you feel that. Uh, you, you hope you see that around you every day. So please take advantage of this incredible opportunity here. And uh, if you have questions uh, for us, uh, please get in touch. Thank you very much. It's great talking to you.